Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The next illness is what is called negative thoughts. Su izana in Urdu bad zanhona to have negative thoughts about somebody. Imam al said that some assumptions are not permissible, such as holding a bad opinion about someone who manifests righteous behavior. This means that your heart is convinced and you have judged him based on your heart's suspicions without proof that warrants such an assumption. There is nothing wrong with having doubts about someone or having a bad opinion of them if it is based on sound reasoning and is not arbitrary. Thus our bad opinion of an open sinner whose open actions indicate uh, his disrespect for Allah is not prohibited. I'm going to amend this a little bit. Right? So the first thing is this notion of zan. Zan is your outlook, how you view someone. In Arabic, su is zan and husni zan. In Urdu, bad zan and husni zan. So the first thing he's saying is that you should not think badly of a person, except he gives you one exception. Let me start with the exception. The exception is that if a person is openly committing a sin, like so openly disobeying. But what does that mean? It still doesn't mean you're not supposed to have a bad opinion of them per se. Our karahat is not for the sinner, the karahat is for the sin itself, right? You should never dislike or feel mm, ill will to, towards somebody because they are a sinner, but rather you should feel dislike and ill will towards that sin, that act itself, right? The reason for that, a very famous Shaykh, Shaykh Ashraf Ali Tanviri Mullah mentioned, and that is, is that, okay, even if he or she is doing a sin openly, and so you have yakin then that this person is doing something bad, but at the same time, you have yakin about your own self, that you do some sin secretly, right? And just like you would not want the whole world to be budzan on you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected us through his sattariyat, or his sifat of being a sattar, which means he veils, he conceals the faults of people. You should then think that, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I can conceal the faults of this person, right? And that is actually a hadith of the faults of some, that a person should conceal the faults of their fellow Muslim. Right? That has many meanings. The first meaning is simple, that you don't want to expose it to others. You don't want to broadcast their false flaws to other people. Right? What you should do is you should go to them yourself if you're able to. Right? Or send them an anonymous email. This is what we get. Right? And if you think that they're doing something that is wrong, right? why go and expose their faults to others? But tell them gently and sincerely. Because actually when you notice somebody's fault, right? there's two ways. There are only two ways about it. I'll explain to you what... Husn is an and su is an as you will understand this. You notice somebody's fault. You have yaqeen that they have a flaw or fault. Husn is an means that you have ikhlas and you would like that person to be able to save themselves from that sin. Then you will do something about that in a mukhlas way. Su is an means that you want that person to be exposed or caught or embarrassed or punished for that. That is su is an. Then you will find some other way to expose that person, right? So, husnizan means then that if you are able to notice the fault and you can do something about it, that's fine. And if it's not your ability to fix that, then you should remove it from your zan, remove it from your perception, make dua for that person if you want. Make dua for that person, but other than that, stop noticing their faults, right? And rather make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can enable us to notice our own faults. This is one meaning. Right? The other thing that he says here is that you should not have a bad opinion about somebody whose outward is righteous. In other words, if your heart is convincing, goes on and that you have your heart suspicions are without proof. So what this means sometimes is that a person gets a type of bam. It's not yakin. Second level, right? Is that there is no reason actually to think badly of this person. There is no sin that you know with yakin that they did. But nonetheless, you still have negative thoughts towards them or negative feelings towards them, right? Or have su is on about them. Based on some shock, some doubt, some suspicion. When you open your mind up to that about having doubts and suspicions about people, well that is also something that is endless. You can have endless doubts and suspicions about other people. And again, we would trade this off that why should I have a bad opinion about a person who I am not sure whether they did something wrong as opposed to why not have a bad opinion about myself because I have yakin about my own faults. I only have shak or vehm about their faults, but I know yakin my own faults. So it's better to look at a person. Going beyond the statement, su'izan. 
also means to think the worst of somebody. So when somebody does something, technically speaking, it's possible. They may have had a good intention in doing it. They may have had a bad intention in doing it. But to always look at the negative side. So this is not negative thoughts. Negative thinking. To be pessimistic. To always think the worst of someone. To never be willing to give somebody else some concession. And that is critical. Because unless you have husn and you won't be able to survive in this world. And you won't be able to survive in your deen. If you always think the worst of people, you're always pessimistic, you always think they're out to get you, you always think they have a bad intention, they have an ulterior motive, they have a hidden agenda. Right? These are words, right? In English, these are catchphrases. Why? These are, this is the vocabulary of negative thinking. Mm-hmm. Ulterior motive, hidden agenda, this is all about negative thinking. You don't want to think about them negatively. Right? You want to be able to think about people positively. And you find this, what are the levels of suizan? So the first and worst type of su'izan is that a person can have su'izan for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we might never say this with our tongue, but that a person can be badzan of Allah, right? Thinking that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this? Why is this happening to me? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not have done this. Now these are thoughts, I'm vocalizing thoughts, but thoughts that can come into our mind. Or about something about the deen. That having su is not about the deen of Allah. That why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this in the Qur'an? Why did he say this? Why did he make the deen like this? Why did the Prophet ﷺ teach this? Why is this thing sunnah? That all of this is su is not. To have su is not about Allah, about the deen, about the Prophet ﷺ, about his teachings. Right? So whenever you... It might happen naturally that you may encounter something in the Qur'an or the sunnah that you don't understand. That your mind does not yet comprehend. That is when your nafs or shaitan might try to attack you and try to make you have suizan. So don't have suizan. Just have humility and say, okay, look, I have an intellect. No matter how educated I might be, my intellect is nakis. Allah subhanahu wa is al-alim, al-hakim, ahkum al-hakimin. So I need to submit, right? The word Islam means to submit. Islam is submission. There's going to be times where Allah subhanahu is going to test us. Everything is going to have to be submitted. There are going to be some times when we have to submit our aql to the deen. Right? That our mind is not going to grasp it. So we submit that, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot have suizan about you. That is guaranteed more than anything else in the world, that you are ahkam al hakimin that you are ahamar nahimin, that you are the most merciful and the most wise of beings. So if this matter is how you've declared it, then certainly it must be as you've declared it, I will not think about it negatively or think about you negatively or think about your deen negatively. Second type of suizan is that you can have for the ahl deen So some person becomes badzan of sahaba. Some people are badzan of the muhaddisin. Some people are badzan of the fuqaha. Some people are badzan, not just by fuqaha, I don't just mean the four imams. You can have a husnizan about them, but to be badzan of their followers. That they would leave the Prophet ﷺ for their imam or do something like that. So to have suizan about somebody, about some mufassir who writes something as tafsir, you don't understand, or you wonder why did he put that here? Or why does he use the Israeli author? Why does he use this weak report? It just boggles our mind sometimes. But you have to have husnizan. You have to think that, look, there must be something. You see, when you go deeply into something, like the example I was giving you that day on Saturday, right, of different positions. Now, even if I go and look into a position and I don't understand it, right, I'm still, husnizan here means I'm still going to think the other position is valid. Why? Because I'm going to think that that person who came up with this position, usne kisi or nukte nazar se is ko dekh hoga to mere samne nahi it would be arrogant for me to think that I, my own examination has covered all of the possibilities and all of the perspectives that he had. It hasn't. How can I claim that I can do that? So my examination of this issue at hand is not making me see why this position would be valid or what the basis for this position is. But I have husnizan on the person who came up with that position that he must have examined it in some ways that are unknown to me. And actually this is rational. How can I equate myself to them? And nothing else were different people. If nothing else, different people in different ages would have different ways. There may be different pehlus, different angles that they saw that I'm not able to see. And one of those angles that they saw must have been why they came up with this. And if I were able to see it, I would be able to see why they came up with it, but I can't see it. So husnizan, right? You have to do amal on it. If it's not far as you don't need to do amal on it, right? Many times people today are too perplexed by the differences that exist in this ummah, right? If there's a difference that's not far as wajib, it's no problem, you don't have to do it. There's some particular type of zikr. Somebody says, yeah, I'm not comfortable with it. No problem. You don't have to do it because that zikr is nothing. And nobody can elevate it. It's not even sunnah, let alone being farz or wajib. Right? But now, again, what I mentioned that is, you can be particularistic on your amal. 
You can say, okay, look, I don't want to do this. Second step is, what is my opinion going to be about the person who did it or the people who do it? That is where you have to have husnazan. That, okay, look, there were also people. There were also people who had ilm of the deen, ilm of the sharia, right? There must be something that they saw that made them comfortable with this that I'm not able to see. Until unless I can see that I will remain uncomfortable with it and I won't do it. But can I blanketly condemn other people with Allah Khwaman, right? And this cannot always be resolved just to discussion. That's also a myth. Just because I meet you doesn't mean that I can show you every perspective that I see. My inability to convince someone does not mean I'm on falsehood, right? If a Hindu comes to me and says, you have to, uh, there must be something, I've looked into Islam. I read up all these things in Islam and I don't understand why you accept this as a religion. So I thought, the Hindu says, I'm being humble, that there must be something that you must see in this that I didn't, and that's why you've chosen to accept it. So I've come to you, I want you to tell me what it is that you've seen. Now I might try to tell him, right, many things. If at the end of the day he still doesn't listen, right, it doesn't mean, what can I do, right? It doesn't mean Islam is false. And he cannot walk away thinking, okay, now I gave, I gave Islam a chance, I asked him what they saw. And they told me what they saw, and that means nothing to me. So now I know with yakin that Islam is a false religion. It's not possible, right? So to save ourselves from su'izan. And really, I mean, at this age, you know, su'izan on Islam, su'izan on the Islamic State. You take the word Islamic State, people think you're talking about some tyrannical... You should have a if somebody said the word Islamic. <laughs> by virtue, if it's a real Islamic State, just by virtue of Islamic, it has to be the most perfect, beautiful thing in the world. You should be thinking Medina. You shouldn't be thinking what the CNN reports make you think about some tyrannical regime that you've all been made to fear. But that's what people say, right? And literally, if I gave up to you and said the Islamic State is going to come to Pakistan, you guys would run for the hills. You'd be running for Dubai. Eh? The elites of this country have villas in Dubai just to save themselves from that day. That Khudana Hasta, right? Something like an Islamic State happened, we will flee to Dubai, right? Allah Akbar, that's Suizan. Su is on, you should have husn is on about everything about the deen. Not everyone, not saying that. Don't keep that you should have to talk about husn is on. Definitely, right? Definitely, but that's at the level of yakin. If you know that somebody is wrong with certainty, and even then, like I said, you should conceal their faults, you should try to help them, or make dua for them, right? Uh, but other than that, right, unless you know with absolute certainty, with absolute clear, certainty means a clear, unequivocal statement from the Qur'an and Hadith that is not open to any interpretation. And there are people, like I mentioned to you in the beginning, that people do, do sins like that openly, still to try to conceal their faults, to think that, okay, fine, maybe I know about what sin they have. That Allah Ta'ala has shown me their sin. Or Allah Ta'ala has not shown me that who knows how many amal they may have done in their life, who knows which amal they did in their life with ikhlas that will be accepted by Allah on the Day of Judgment. And I don't know if I have any amal like that, that I've ever done in my life with such ikhlas that Allah will accept it for me on the Day of Judgment. So maybe this person has something like that. Allah says in the Quran that your good deeds can erase your bad ones. But I've seen his bad ones. I don't know how many good deeds he has. I don't know. Maybe he's got the eraser. And I wouldn't worry about myself. Maybe I've got the ink and I don't have an eraser. But Allah Alam, who knows, right? So husn is is critical. Husnizan is really an essential part of the deen, and if we lose our husnizan, it's very difficult. Very, very difficult. Right? The next thing is vanity. Vanity, there are different words for this, right? But vanity is a particular word in Arabic, is ujjah, as opposed to kibber and takabar. So I'll just very briefly explain what those other two are, and we'll do them later when they come. Ujjab is very well translated as vanity or conceit. It means to think highly of yourself without necessarily looking down on anybody else. Right? To think highly of yourself. Vanity and conceit, these are the two best words to translate. Ujjab. Kibber means to think that you're better than somebody else. It's relative. That I am better than someone else. The kubber means to act on that kibber. To do something. Right? To cut somebody in line because you think you're better than them and they should wait on the bank and you're Sayyid Saab and you should be able to go straight to the counter. Right? Or any other thing like that, that you belittle someone, you talk to someone, you sidestep someone, you do anything on the basis that I am better than them. Right? That is Takumbar. So what we want to do right now is Ujjab. In one sense, Ujjab is done in the beginning because Ujjab is the beginning of all this. Right? Ujjab can lead to Kibber which can lead to Takumbar. But when you think about when you're cleansing, so ujub is the last thing to go. In fact, some of Mashaikh have said that ujub is the last sin. That, I mean, it means it stays in a person that's so deep that you have to really dig deep to get it out. That a person has ujub has vanity for themselves, right? 
And and you will find some people have talked about and speculation, but about what was shaitan's asl sin. Some say it was hasad, some say it was takabur, some say it was this, it was ujab. That he thought highly of himself. And because he thought highly of himself, that is what ultimately led to his refusal to do sajda to Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. Or let me rephrase that, that is what ultimately led to him to disobey the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state of being able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's unimaginable. It's ajeeb. I cannot imagine that. You are in the presence of Allah. You hear from your own whatever ears that you have as a jinn. <laughs> Allah's command, first to do. Allah's command. No, not from a Quran or from a hadith. Allah directly commands you to do something. Right there in front of Him and you disobey and then you shoot back. I can't even imagine. Right? And when you say in Urdu, but the mizi, you want to understand, but the mizi, look at what shaitan talks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right there live, it's an unfathomable thing. I cannot imagine such a being exists. Actually, shaitan himself, something must have happened. Such behavior is unimaginable. What put a veil over him? Different people. Hasad, Ujub, these are like the master sins, if you will. Hasad and Ujub slash the cover, these are two very major sins, right? And some say the root of all this is Ujub. Once you start thinking highly of yourself. So let's read this. Ujub is the aggrandizing of some blessing while forgetting that it came from Allah. So the very first words in the Quran al-Karim, if you take out the tasmiyah, the very first words are Alhamdulillah. The praise itself befits only Allah. Praise proper can only be attributed to Allah. All praises belong to Allah. Each and every praise is Allah's alone. So that means that we are not actually self-praise. If you take this ayah or this, this, this alfaz as a negation of self-praise, that is a negation of ujah, right? And so what he's mentioning here is what happens is it's natural. Allah Ta'ala has given us talents. All of us have different talents. Somebody might be talented in their studies, somebody might be talented in sports. Allah Ta'ala has given us a talent. And the teaching of Alhamdulillah that is meant to save us from ujab is to realize that there's no nothing in me. Whatever I have has just been given to me by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So if I'm smart, Allah Ta'ala gave me that smart. If I'm a good cricketer, Allah Ta'ala gave me that ability. If I'm handsome or beautiful or whatever, all these things have been given me. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said what you call naz or nakhre. That's not there in Islam. We're humble people. We think that this is a bestowal from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So treat that blessing by realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the exalted, is the fashioner and the bestower of blessings. He is the one who fash- who designs these ni'mats. He made that beauty. It's not, if somebody is beautiful, why should we feel anything? It's not like I designed this, be- somebody designed their beauty, right? Or designed their intellect or designed their ability, right? Neither did we design it. Nor did we bestow it on ourselves. Allah designed it and He gave it to us. So what, what hissa do we have? We just received it. Usmein kaun se kamal? Kamal us zat ka hai, jisne jamal ko banaya. Right? Ya jisne jamal ko ata kiya. So that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, all praise is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Any blessing that we have, any blessing that we have, and I'm using the, our inner self, some people also can have ujib due to their possessions, due to their children. Right? Some women in front of the aunties with the other auntie, right? Deliberately to note the other auntie who you know is having a tough time with her son. That Mere Bete Neji Mujhe phone kiya, or Baat hi pyar karta hai, or Baat mohabbat karta hai, and ye, and wo, and right? Uh, actually, right? <laughs> what is being done? This is being done, right? Or you have some, you know, you know you have a friend whose daughter is unable to get married, oh gee, mere beti ki mashallah, itna charishta aya hai, or wo aisa hai, or wo, wo hai, or wo ye hai, right? That is also ujjim, right? No, this is nothing. You, you, what was it in you? This is mahaz, mahaz, only the fazl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He enabled your son to do that, or your daughter to get married, or, or whatever it is that you have. Whether it's in your children, or your belongings, or your business, or whatever success, or attribute, or greatness that we have. So treat it by realizing that Allah the Exalted, is the fashioner, the maker, the designer of the blessings and the bestower of your blessing. And realize that because of your impotence, your complete lack of power, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, we have nothing. We have no ability, no might, no power. You can produce neither benefit nor harm. We cannot act, we cannot create nafa or nuksan. We cannot create nafa or dhara, as we say. You cannot create benefit or harm. Indeed, vanity originates from one's ignorance of these two manners. Right? When we become full of ourselves, that's ujjah, right? It's because we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why so many places all over Allahu Akbar, in the adhan four times, the kama, 
Allahu Akbar. All the time. Takbir al Allahu Akbar. Over and over again. The kibra'i of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His majesty, His might, His greatness, His superiority. Why? It's meant for us to realize that we are severe. We are small. We are humble. We are humble beings. Right? The more and more humble you get, and really you will find people who have an absence of this, people who don't have ujab. You will think that they have incredible attributes, but they will think of themselves as nothing. Right? The Prophet said indeed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that person who views himself as nothing and others view him as nothing. These are some special people in this world. That they view themselves as nothing and others also view them as nothing. You can say, Gum nam fakir. Right? Actually, but he views himself as nothing and others also view him as nothing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Allah knows that he is something. That there is something special about him. Right? So this is Ujjah. If you remember when we did the Seer, we did Surah Al-Qaf, right? Uh, here, this is Ujjah. The next thing is fraud. The next thing is fraud. This is called Rish in Arabic. Rish. Fraud. Deception. Fraud, deception is to conceal some fault or harm, either religious or worldly, right? From someone... So to know that there's something defective and you sell it anyway, happens many times. You buy something and it turns to be defective. You go and return something out of the shopping box and you return something in America, there's like a whole process that goes back to the manufacturer. You return something and the guy puts it right back on the shelf, right? And you told him it was flawed. He puts it right back on the shelf in front of you. I'm amazed. He gives you your money back to get rid of you, but in front of you he has no qualms putting it right back on the shelf. And maybe the next person who comes in will be given that very same item. The fraud and deception is to conceal some fault or harm, either religious or worldly, even from one who is part of a minority or someone who has a treaty with Muslims. This is uh, the people who are known as the dhimmis or the people who pay the jizya. In other words, he's saying that's not something you can do to a non-Muslim either. In essence, what he's saying is that you cannot deceive or befraud even a non-Muslim. It's not just iman, it's your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's your own honesty, your sitq between you and your rum that demands that you cannot engage in any type of fraud and deception. Others have interpreted fraud to be the embellishment of something that lacks any real benefit. So to falsely peddle your wares, to do, to claim that something has powers or has attributes or is greater of an ability that you can, right? This is marketing basically. And there are very few MBAs here, unfortunately, today. But much of MBA, much of marketing is predicated. In essence, it's fraud, right? In essence, it's fraud. It's very limited. It's a, it's a fine line, right? And they may be, and not even for honesty, but just to protect themselves from a suit, a civil litigation suit. They might not literally say something that is a lie. Or there will be some fine print over there, right? Or in ads in America, they roll off a couple of really fast thing and at the end that... You know, and this, this, this medicine may be harmful to your health, blah, 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 blah. Like very quickly, so they've done it just for, you know, just to, for legal, to save themselves for legal liability. It's amazing. The fear, if the, if we had as much fear of our liability in front of Allah on the day of judgment, the way these people have fear of liability over a court in this world, we would become the awliya, the mutakeen of this ummah. Literally. Right? They, they have so much fear, uh, for liability in this world. So that's the second aspect, right? And we do this. Let me explain how we do it. Okay, fine. We're not in marketing, right? And we might not be doing that. How do we fraud a person? Well, sometimes when you want something or you want something to happen, one thing that sometimes we do is we exaggerate or we embellish the account of something in order to name that exaggeration is a type of fraud, right? You really want something to happen. Or let me take again the wrist issue. You want somebody to marry someone. Some people literally, I'm telling you, because there have been cases of this fraud being exposed. And unfortunately, sometimes the fraud is exposed after it's too late for the person to do anything about it, right? That Neji, Vubi Neke, Vubi Hijab Penegi Shadi Ke Baat. So, Narka says, Acha, Tikke, Agar Vokiari Ke Vubi Neke, Hijab Penegi Shadi Ke Baat, Tame Shadi Kar Lata, right? And turns out that the girl is totally not like that. But the mother just wanted her son to marry that girl, right? I mean, I'm telling you, frauding your own son. <laughs> this is how everything happens. Frauding your own son on a marriage issue. Why? Openly. Then the mother will say that because Right? And she's my niece. 
So she will view me. And I'm not saying this itself is not wrong necessarily. If you are going to live in an extended family, living in the, uh, the mother-in-law wants to pick a woman for her son who thinks would have compatibility. But to fraud the son, right? I literally had a case, I'm talking about a real case like this. And the boy came to me and said, what am I supposed to do? Right? Nikah ho gaya, magar rukhsati nahi hoi. And I've realized now, and I know it after nikah, obviously, I mean, you get to know the person that's opened up. She's not on the same dini wavelength I am. And I know she'll make my mother very happy, and my mother's happy, but what am I supposed to do? And bachar me parasham, right? All of this because of fraud, right? By your own mother, right? And he's not upset with his mom at all because he loves his mother, so the love of the mother making overlook it. He understands what the mother needs, but at the end of the day, he was frauded, right? Very, you know, do not fraud another. You should always think that, look, and sometimes what people do is they say, and this no, this English phrase is completely against Islam. What phrase is that? That the ends justify the means. The ends do not justify the means in Islam. They don't. If it's a noble end, Allah Ta'ala will put barakah and give you a way to do it honestly. You don't have to fraud somebody to do it. You don't have to deceive somebody to do it. It might seem to you that this is the quickest way or the easiest way. Have some sabr. Wait. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will enable. It's not necessary. Fine. If, you're, if, if, if the mother... If, if for example in that case, the mother had the ability to fraud, if she held herself back and made dua ta'ala, the Ya Allah Bikrim, I know this girl would be perfect for me, right, as a daughter-in-law. But she's not on the same wavelength as my son. And I know my son genuinely wants somebody who's more religious. Allah, I will sacrifice this girl for the sake of the deen of my son in complete tawakkul reliance on you that you will send a girl for Rishta who is also compatible to his deen and will also be a good daughter-in-law and a good uh, whatever life companion for me. Allah Ta'ala can do it. <laughs> We are selling Allah Ta'ala short actually. When we try to fraud, what we're doing is selling Allah Ta'ala short. We think that we need to ingrain in the fraud and deception to make something happen. Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala could have made it happen without the fraud. You just had to turn yourself to Him. Another fraud and deception some of us do is on our CVs, or on our resumes, or in our interviews. That's another type of fraud and deception we do. In marketing our skills or our abilities, right? Classic fraud and deception, you guys know plagiarism, no need to bring that up. There's plenty of other sessions that you can have. That's another type of fraud and deception that occurs in this world, right? Uh, to be honest, right? The opposite of this to be honest, to state something as it is, right? When people sell things, when you sell a used car, sell a property, right? All types of fraud takes place in the Ummah suffering because of this. The Ummah is really, you don't appreciate the suffering. Uh, because of this uh, doesn't mean right that all you have to do is eliminate fraud you still have to do lots of other things become people of salah become people of taqwa but the ummah is suffering because of the fraud and the deception that we perpetrate on another the ultimate fraud is to fraud yourself is to deceive yourself self-delusion to deceive yourself to embellish your sins such that you think you're fraud yourself we market our own sins to ourselves the dunya gift wraps itself for us and we also Market it for ourselves. So to deceive ourselves. Or to think that no, it's, made, it's not really that wrong. Or my intention is okay even though the action is wrong. All types of deceptions we keep ourselves in. right? Unless you can escape your own inner deception. right? Maybe, that, maybe that's one reason Allah Ta'ala has made us in this, living in a communal way that people deceive us. Because we're deceiving ourselves about our deen and our Lord. So Allah has chosen that fine. If you want to commit that ultimate self-delusion, then live in a community where you all deceive and delude one another. right? So to eliminate ourselves from the self-delusion, from the self-delusion, to magnify the harm of our sins, and to be honest about the humbleness of our accomplishments. After this came anger. That is something that we had already done uh, with you last time. Last thing we will do today is ghafla. Ghafla is heedlessness, mindlessness, to be unaware, to be uncaring, right? And this is a word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala group Allah has mentioned in the Quran al-Qim, the ghafilin, the ghafilin. About them Allah says in the Quran, أُولَٰئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامْ بَلْ هُمْ أَذَلْ أُولَٰئِكَمْ هُمُ الْغَافِلُونَ Right? That they are like animals. They are like animal life. In other words, they've descended, they've become subhuman. بَلْ هُمْ أَذَلْ Actually, no, they're sub-animals. They're even below the animals. They're even more base. Who are they? Who are such people? These are the ghafilun, the people who are ghafil. So the ultimate level of heedlessness is to be ghafil of Allah. 
a person who is leading a life who is ghafil of Allah and it's at the ultimate level of disbelief, then an atheist in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes has descended so low. There's no meaning to their life. There's no meaning. To, and they themselves say there's no meaning, there's no greater meaning to life. They're the first ones to say that. That's their actual position, that there is no greater meaning to life. That we're just so that's like the animals then. Right? That you're just living to eat and to enjoy and to live and whatever and it's survival of the fittest. And This, this is the animal world. Now why are you lower than animals? Because you were in sun, you sold yourself short. You had the potential to be ashraf al-makhlukat. The potential, every human being is not just by being human. We're not ashraf al-makhlukat. Humanity, insaniyat, has the potential to be greater than the angels. Not every insan, in fact, in very few insans may realize and reach that potential. And that potential, by the way, is not due to our aql. Some people understand, we think that we're ashraf al-makhlukat because we're the smartest creatures on earth. And therefore we dominate the animal life and we dominate the plant life. No. You're ashraf al-makhlukat because of your kalb, because of the taqwa fil kulub, because of the, the, the piety that you can bring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that no other creation has been allowed to bring. Due to the voluntary iman, the voluntary love for Allah you were allowed to bring, which no other creation has been allowed to do that voluntarily. Other than, I'm just casting aside the jinn for a moment. That is why we are ashraf al-makhlukat. So heedlessness, he writes, and ghaflat is being careless concerning what Allah has commanded one to do and has prohibited. Scholars of this science, means people of the science of purification, consider ghaflat to be the source of all wrongdoing. Its cure is to be found in four deeds, all of which possess rectifying qualities. Okay, before I get to the cures and the treatment, let me mention the different types of ghaflat. So the first ghaflat I mentioned was absolute ghaflat from Allah. The contrast to that is zikr. The opposite to this in the Quran is zikr. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu thakru Allah dhikran kathira. Right, that we must make abundant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with kathrat. Very few things are mentioned in the Qur'an al-Kareem. Allah I think even zikr might be the only thing in which Allah has mentioned this adjective of kathrat that you should do this abundantly. Right? That is to save us from ghafla because ghafla is something that keeps overpowering us. We're always forgetful of Allah. So much so that we're forgetful of Allah in our ibadat. We're forgetful of Allah in the halat sawm, in the state of fasting. So to fight that forgetfulness, we always have to keep reminding, reminding, remembering, remembering, connecting ourselves back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second level of ghaflat is this, that he mentions that being ghafil about Allah's commands. The opposite to this type of ghaflat is itaat, obedience, right? Obedience to Allah's commands and staying away from His prohibitive. Sometimes we are ghafil, right? And you, this is the type of ghaflat you use a lot in Urdu. That wo ghaflat se mutsharagya, wo ghaflat se mene wo kiya, jo nahi karna tha. Ya ghaflat wo mutsharagya, jo karne wali baat thai, right? Ghaflat, right? One person once said in a Persian couplet, uh, so dam ghafil, so dam kafir. He said about himself that I feel that every moment I spend in my life in a state of ghaflat is as if I spent it in kufr. Where was my iman? Where was the nur of my iman that I was absent from Allah? I was not able to remember Allah. And I might as well have been in a state of kufr. In other words, for example, if you look, if you're going to go into New York and go into a computer lab, and there's a Muslim typing on the computer, there's a non-Muslim typing on the computer, and the Zahir, there's no difference between them at that moment. They're both doing the same thing. But the difference can only be is in their heart. If you open up the heart of the non-Muslim, it's empty of the remembrance of Allah. If you open up the heart of the Muslim, he's also empty at that moment, then there is no difference between them at all, in Zahir or in Batan, right? And so the notion is that one should try never to be ghafil of Allah. To always and always remember him because it's when you forget him is when you sin. You ask any person who commits any sin and you ask them that at the moment you did that sin, were you thinking of Allah? Were you thinking of the Quran? Were you thinking of the Prophet? Some you said, At that moment I totally forgot Allah, I forgot Quran, I forgot Rasulullah, I forgot Sunnah. So if you are distant from Allah, the book of Allah, the messenger of Allah, there's no way that our primary identity as the Abd of Allah will remain at that moment. And when we leave that identity of Ubudiyat, then we can fall into sin. So ghaflat is the biggest thing. This is in this sense why he's saying it's a source of all wrongdoing. It's a source of sin. Because a person does sin in a state of ghaflat. So much so that when a person wants to do sin deliberately, they try to remove anything that can create their zikr. They don't want to be reminded of Allah. Sometimes people say, no, that's why they don't pray. Right? Because I did the sin, I mean, how can I go for fajr if I plan to do the sin again? What is going on in the tabiat? I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. If you sin, you should still show up for fajr. But what is their tabiyah trying to do? 
Their tabiat knows that I can only do that sin when I'm ghafil. So therefore I cannot do something that may make me zakir. If I'm hell bent on doing the sin, I will stay away from anything that would remind me of Allah. And they start cutting themselves off. They don't want to hear the nasiha. Right? This is something Sayyidina Umar Rudin mentioned that to you should love that somebody should give you nasiha. Right? And a person who doesn't want to change wants to say ghafil, wants to say ignorant. But to say ignorance is bliss only if you want to lead a life of sin is ignorance bliss. Right? Only if you want to be a hedonist can ignorance be called bliss. Only a hedonistic society could ever come up with such a statement that ignorance is bliss. Allah Akbar. Ignorance is not bliss at all. Ilm is bliss. Knowledge is bliss. Ilm and nafi, knowledge that benefits that is bliss. Right? So, when we're ghafil, we do sin. A person will say totally, you know, ha, huh, if a person had some level of connection to Allah in general, then after they sin, the zikr will come back to them. Then they'll feel the remorse, they will feel the regret, they will realize, what did I just do to myself? What did I just do? What did I just say? Right? If they're even more heedless, right, then if they leave a life, this is ghafilin, as opposed to active ghaflan, ghaflin is a person who is in a state of ghaflan. That person is then gone, right? Even after they do the sin, they don't feel any remorse or regret. Their ghaflan continues after that sin. To Alhamdulillah, I would hope and, and expect that most of us, all of us, inshallah, these are at this level that at least ghaflat is just a state that overcomes us. It's not a permanent reality that we're in. And whenever it does overcome us and perhaps leads us to commit a sin, we inshallah immediately then remember and let that nadma, that remorse, that regret flow forth from our heart. So the cures that he mentions is cures to be found in four deeds. Khair, there are many cures for this. It may be limitless. The whole deen. Anything in the deen can be a cure for ghaflat, right? Because at this level, anything can be considered zikr. But he is particularly mentioning here Imam Al-Mulud four things. Number one, he mentions istighfar, to seek the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seek forgiveness from whatever act that perpetuated in our ghaflat. That is one level. The istighfar of the awam, as I mentioned, istighfar of the plurality, of the commonality, is that they make istighfar from their sins. Another level of istighfar is to make istighfar from our ghaflat. This is why you notice in the big ibadat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to make istighfar afterwards. It's so good to say, astaghfirullah if you pray salah. Why? Did you just do some sin? You just prayed salah. <laughs> why? The istighfar there is not because you did a sin or disobedience. It's due to the ghaflat that happened in my salah. Right? There's an ayah, and I can't remember it now, but the ayah about hajj mentions that after Yom al-Arafat, you should go and you should seek the forgiveness. After Arafat, after, not during. Yom al-Arafat khair is the day of istighfar. After that, Yallah, I'm a hajj. I just did hajj. It's such an azim ibadat. After that, do istighfar. <laughs> but what is that istighfar that is seeking the forgiveness from our ghaflat? So sometimes, you know, it's a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in one hadith 70, another hadith mentioned a hundred times, you say istighfar a day. When you ask istighfar a hundred times a day, and some people say that I do it in a rote way, I don't feel anything, you can think of this. This itself is istighfar. If you cannot recall to yourself your sins at that moment, think of your ghaflat. Think of all the prayers that we prayed absentmindedly. Think all of the sadzas in which you said Subhana Rabbi Lala unconsciously. If you start thinking like that, then Allah Akbar, there will be no shortage of istighfars that a person will be able to do. Our ghaflat from Allah. Think of all those moments when Allah was kareeb and I didn't feel Him. That's our whole life. When Allah says in the Quran, for any kareeb, that means 24 hours He is kareeb. And I was ghafil of His qurb. When He says, Nahnu akrab ilayhim and hablad wanid, I'm akrab to you, then you early. I was ghafil from His akrabiyyat. Any moment in my life which I didn't feel, that means I was ghafil because his akrabiyat is daim, it's perpetual. It's always, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always more intimate to us than our own selves. So then when you open that up, then istighfar, then we can be doing istighfar our whole lives because we spent our whole lives in ghaflat. So the first thing then, the first cure he's mentioning for ghaflat is istighfar. Both for those acts that we did out of ghaflat and second for the ghaflat itself that led us to that act of sin. Third, is then for those things that we stick to in our life that create the ghaflat. There are some things, some companies, some friends, some things that we do in our life that perpetuate our ghaflat and we're not able to leave them. Right? So we should ask Allah's forgiveness for that. In Dua Kunut, what do we say in Dua Kunut? It's the Wanatruku Mayyaf Juruk. It's the Dua we make. We're pledging the Wanatruku, we do Tark, we leave that person. Man, that person. Yaf Juruk, who does Fujur of you who disobeys you openly. But we say that in the door, we say that at night, but then we don't do it in the day or in the night. It's nonsensical. 
some one of the benefits of knowing the meanings of du'a kunut is you realize what it is that you're praying for. And then you can actually make yourself a person who becomes the own means of fulfilling that du'a, that we actually do what we pray, we do what we pledge. Right? The second thing is visiting the righteous, visiting the salihin, visiting the siddiqeen. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullahu wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. Right? Oh, you who believe, become people of taqwa. How? One way you can do that. How can you become people of taqwa? One way is to join the company, put yourself in the presence of the sadiqeen. That's what kunu means. Join your being, put your being with them. Allah ta'ala didn't say, وَأَتِيُوا sadiqeen. You could have said that, obey them. He could have said, وَاتَّبِعُوا sadiqeen. Follow them. He said, just, it's sufficient just to put your being in their being, to put your presence in their presence. That will remove your ghaflat. That will remind you. When you see the actual way, these are the people of the Sanat al-Mustaqeen, the Siddiqeen, Shuhada, and Salihin, and Nabiin. Right? Ab Nabiin are not alive anymore. Shuhada, once they become Shuhada in a hakiki sense, and you cannot keep their company, they're not dead, but they're not present anymore on this earth. So the two people are left, Siddiqeen and Salihin, that are mentioned. Right? When you put yourself in their company, then you will realize, you will see living Sratul Mustaqim in front of you. Right? You, those of you who were there for the Tafsir Surah Fatah know why I'm saying this. And Sratul Surah Fatah describes Sratul Mustaqim as Sratul Ladina an Amta Alayhim. And elsewhere in the Quran, he says, An Amullahu, that the four groups that Allah sent in Amata are the Nabiin, Siddiqeen, Shuhada, and Salihin. Right? So when you keep yourself in the company, the way I used to explain this way back when I teach Islamic studies was what I used to call sneakers. Those who took their betos, they're all gone now, graduated, 08s. The sneakers example, maybe 09s, I used this on them. Sneakers, right? No? Don't remember. Bakr song, sneakers. Chalo, agar yade, agar te to, ghaflat ki halal, right? That is that when you wear sneakers, which you guys call joggers in Pakistan, or British English tennis shoes, very proper, lawn tennis, your tennis shoes, we call it sneakers in America, right? When you wear sneakers, you don't realize how worn out your sneakers are over time. If somebody gets brand new white sneakers and you happen to stand next to them and you look at your foot and their foot, then you realize how worn out your sneakers are. <laughs> it's only when you put your sneakers next to, or even with my clothes, with my clothes, if somebody gives me some new kapra or I buy a new kapra and then I put this next to them, I'm like, oh my God, I was wearing this so in public. <laughs> right? You forget, you don't realize when you put it next to something. That is what it means when you put yourself in the presence of the Siddiqeen and Salihin. When you see the Izhar, because actually deen, certainly it was revealed in the Qur'an, and was revealed in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And the deen is something that is lived, it's a living tradition. These people who are Siddiqeen and Salihin, they're people who are their deen incarnate. That's what they are. So they're the sneakers. When you put yourself in their presence, then, then you will see all the, like you saw in your sneakers, the grayness, the spots, the stains, the wrinkles, the cracks, the deficiencies. That's what happens when we put ourselves in the company of the pious ones. And our yakin also gets restored because we remember that okay, yeah, Islam was not revealed to create somebody like me. It was revealed to create somebody like that. Right? That is the shan of Islam. That is the power of Islam. That it can bring people, elevate. That's what it means. Elevate people to this maqam that they are above the ranks of angels. Elevate people that they get the salam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Elevate people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes their name. Very beautiful hadith in Bukhari, once the Sussan went to Sayyidina Ubay ibn Niqab radiallahu anhu. He said, Ya Ubay, Allah subhanahu wa wants to hear you recite Quran. Allahu Akbar kamina. Sayyidina Ubay ibn Niqab said, Ya Rasulullah, did Allah take my name? Literally, that's it. I, I, the English is not. The Urdu captures the beauty of Arabic. Okay. Ya Rasulullah, Allah ta'ala na mina naam lekar ka. Rasulullah ka ki haa aapka naam lekar ka. Allahu Akbar kamina. What is this deen that can take a person from the door of Jahiliyyah and make him such a sahaba, make him such a person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes their name in front of their Prophet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to hear them. He's as-sami. He wants to, he's as-sami, all hearing, but he wants to put his khas sama, put his khas tawajjuh of listening onto the kirat of a human being, of his own kalam. What are these people? <laughs> that is a person who has risen above the ranks of angels. That is a person. That is the power of Islam, to create people like that. And you see that, that you see that in the Sahaba. This is what in Surah Waqi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us the Sabikun as Sabikun, the Mukarrabun, the first, the foremost of the foremost, those who are Mukarrab, those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
It's an incredible thing. You read Surah Waqiyah, it's incredible. Right? And there are lots of people, right? Thullatum and awlin, lots of people from the beginning and a few people. But there will be people left. It also shows these people are always exist. They may become khalil, but they can never become ma'doom. They can never become non-existent. They will always exist because this hukum of the Qur'an, kunu ma sadiqeen, is universal, is perpetual. If Allah Ta'ala has given this hukum, kunu ma sadiqeen, and the Qur'an is a universal, has to be followed by every single person in every single age, right? That means that the sadiqeen must be there. You may not agree as to who they are. <laughs> you may not be able to find them, right? Uh, but if you're sincere, you'll be able to find them. There's no way a person wants to do amal on a verse of the Qur'an. might be difficult. It cannot be impossible. There's no verse of the Qur'an that can be impossible to do amal on. It's not possible. Right? At best, it can be difficult. Right? Uh, and so when you keep their company, you lose. And this is one of the signs in our tradition of the skiyah or the sawbuf. This is what the mashayikh write. That what is the sign of a siddiqin and salim? This is the right. This is the sign. That when you're with him, your ghaflat goes down and your zikr goes up. And when you leave their presence, your zikr stays up. It stays with you. Different people take according to their own zarf. It's like a flame. Some people sit by a flame and they are warm. Why they sit by the flame? And when they leave the flame, eventually they will feel cold again. Whatever warmth they took from the flame lasts with them a little bit. Other people will sit by the flame and they will be able to take some of the flame itself. They will take a piece of the flame with them, a heat source, a small heat source. So even when they're away, that memory or that gathering is able to be a heat source, able to be a reminder, able to be a zikr for them. It's a residual effect, not as strong as the flame itself, but it's a small thing. A third level of people are those who may be able to take so much of the flame that not only are they able to get heat from it, they will be able to ignite or light others, right? So there are different levels of which people historically have benefited from the Siddiqeen or from the Salihin. But one thing that eliminates our ghaflat, there is a cure for ghaflat, is to keep pious company. Inshallah Aziz on Thursday, which we will have our last sitting for Ramadan, we will finish this. Uh, on ghaflat and maybe do one or two other things and then I'll announce some schedule for after Ramadan with how we can complete this. Wa akhirat da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.